Good afternoon. Welcome to the Federal Railroad Administration's Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail Grant Program Information Session, Eligibility and Agreements. Before I begin, I would like to take you through the items you see on your screen. The PowerPoint presentation for the webinar appears in the top left window of your dashboard. If you have problems viewing the presentation slides, ensure you are not using a web browser to view the webinar. If you are, exit the webinar, download the Adobe Connect desktop application, and re-enter the webinar through the Adobe Connect desktop application. In the Troubleshooting Tips pod at the bottom left of your dashboard are some internet network video and audio troubleshooting steps to ensure that your participants can both hear and see the presentation. Next to the troubleshooting test pod is the web links pod, which contains links to useful resources related to the Fed State Partnership Program. To view the web links, double click the title of the link. At the bottom of the right, at the bottom right of the Adobe Connect dashboard is a technical support pod. This is where you can ask our support team questions about any technical issues you are having. Above the technical support pod is the questions for presenters pod for the questions and answer session. This is where you can ask questions that you will they'll be answered during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Thank you to all who submitted pre-webinar questions. Please note that a recording of today's presentation will be uploaded to FRA's website in about a week. The presentation file will be available about 24 hours from now. Before the presentation begins, I would like to review the webinar format. We will start with a brief welcome and then launch into the presentation. Following the presentation portion of the webinar, we'll have a question and answer session dur during which FRA will address your pre-webinar questions and those posted in the questions for presenters pod. And now, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Ryan Arbuckle, Transportation Industry Analyst at the Federal Railroad Administration. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so yeah, before we get started in, in talking about our, our, our content today, that's uh, primarily going to focus on the Fed State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail, NOFO, that recently published at the end of last year, I want to just highlight a few upcoming information sessions that we, we have in the next couple of weeks, uh, early February timeframe. So the next one coming up, uh, coming up by, uh, next week is the Major Capital Projects, uh, where we're going to focus uh, on domestic sourcing plan, uh, some letters of intent and phase funding agreements and, and kind of highlight some of the uh, key points from the major capital project guidance that just went out uh, shortly ago, about last week, I think, uh, what got published. Um, and then on February 7th, we're going to have a, another information session that's going to focus on project narrative and statement of work. It's very similar to the other sessions that we've had in the past for the other grant programs. This one will be focusing on the Fed State Partnership Program. And then in February 9th, we'll have the quarter identification and development program, uh, very similar to how we've, again, done uh, the general NOFO webinar uh, for all of our other programs. So uh, encourage those interested in, in participating in those to go ahead and register as they become available um, on our website. Uh, if you're not uh, registered on our website to, to get these notifications, we, we encourage you to do that as well since we, we send out e-blasts. Uh, for, for registration on those. Um, so as we get ready to jump in today, I just want to, again, make sure everyone's in the right place. We're talking about the Fed State Partnership uh, for Inner-City Passenger Rail uh, program uh, today. Uh, so questions kind of uh, about some of the other grant programs. We, we've done prior webinars on, on all those, and those are available on our website. And we encourage uh, applicants or, or stakeholders to go and, and view those if you have questions pertaining to some of the other programs. Uh, today, we're really going to focus on the Fed State Partnership uh, for Inner Passenger Rail, both the national and the uh, the NEC one. So, uh, let's jump on in. Uh, so today we're going to have you know as you can hear myself, um, and I'm joined by two colleagues, uh, Jenny Zhang and uh, Miriam, and they're going to jump through. Uh, we'll, we're going to kind of hand it off back and forth between us and and kind of talk through this presentation and uh, and then open it up for for questions. So here's, here's kind of our roadmap for our, our webinar today. We're going to start with uh, the Fed State Partnership uh, Program. Uh, it's a relationship to our, our new program, Quarter Identification. Uh, then kind of jump into some applicant and project eligibility under Fed State Partnership. And then navigate to best practices on uh, the agreements and then open it up for Q&A. 
So without further ado, here we go. So Fed State Partnership uh, is a repurposed program uh, under the, the bill, uh, formerly Fed State Par Partnership for, Inter uh, for State of Good Repair, apologies. Uh, and there's a lot of tie-in and connection with the corridor identification and development program uh, that's newly uh, formed under uh, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. Uh, so we want to kind of, it, it kind of makes sense to have these kind of two hand in hand and, and kind of talk through some of the interactions between quarter identification and Fed State Partnership um, as we're talking about Fed State Partnership as this Fed State Partnership program will be the, uh, the end result, so to speak, of the quarter identification program. Um, so very similar to what we have on the NEC, the quarter identification and development program is going to really establish that pipeline, that foundation framework of identifying corridors and doing the initial project planning, project development, and the service development plan for those corridors to get them ready to come in for that project planning, design, and final construction uh, that's uh, really going to be captured under Fed State Partnership. Uh, so we can kind of see here it's it's it's. Uh, an iterative process, and we're encouraging applicants to come in under corridor ID if you're establishing a new uh, corridor uh, to help get you prepared uh, for Fed State Partnership funds and in future years. Um, you can see there's a little bit of an overlap between some of the eligibilities, right? So both project planning and project development are eligible under both corridor identification and Fed State Partnership but we would really encourage applicants to come in under quarter identification because that program is really a, a relationship building with FRA. It allows you to, um, to take advantage of that, the flexibilities under that program, as well as if you're under the quarter identification program, there is a statutorily uh, uh, preference under uh, for projects under quarter ID into Fed state in subsequent years. So to take advantage of that, preference, you have to kind of be inside the quarter ID program. Um, so we're, you know, really encouraging the, the creation of, of that program and, and people coming into it. Um, the, the solicitation is, is on the streets and uh, is, is available in the Federal Register to kind of uh, look at. And we've been doing a lot of outreach and engagement on that. So I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there on that. And again, we're going to be having a, a webinar focusing on that program uh, in early February. So as we're talking about Fed State Partnership, uh, we want to identify kind of, you know, this is our project life cycle um, stages. So the, the various stages in which a grant program or a, a project will uh, navigate through uh, from initial planning on through to construction and operation. And as you can see here, we've identified the three tracks under which um, projects are eligible under the Fed State Partnership Program. So we have the first is project planning, and you can see here we have uh, some, some bullets to kind of highlight some of those you know, activities in which um, kind of make up that project planning stage. And again, as I said, both project planning and project development are both eligible under quarter identification and Fed State Partnership, but we would again really encourage those projects to kind of come in under quarter identification to again take advantage of those uh, initial, that, that program and then feed into the Fed State Partnership program when you're kind of ready for more track three uh, and construction uh, elements underneath it. So again, moving into kind of track two project development, you can see that that's really like NEPA, PE and those cost estimates and, and, and budget schedule um, development plans. And then kind of moving into track three, which is that final design, that, that, that engineering, the, the finalization of those budgets and schedules. Um, so, you know, the, the project lifecycle stages are covered as well um, under our major capital guidance uh, that, that recently came out. And we'll be kind of mentioning those again in the, the subsequent webinar that we're going to do on the 26th. But this is the framework and foundation for how projects are, are navigated through um, the stages of development through all of our grant programs. So we just want to kind of highlight um, where these fall under the Fed State one, uh, Fed State program, and what the applicable tracks are within here. So kind of, again, speaking to that, 
you know, what, what the expectation is of applicants coming in is that they really need to identify what track or lifestyle, life cycle stage their project is in and, and really kind of fit their project into that, that stage, right? So if you're in the planning, project planning stage, uh, we would expect that you're kind of coming in for that initial phase, right? That track one uh, program or project, not really coming in for final design under the FedSA partnership program because you, you haven't done that initial project planning and project development. So we, we really are encouraging applicants to uh, pick the appropriate track that fits the life cycle stage of your project. Uh, that helps ultimately lead you and your project to get through the stages in a more efficient manner and to kind of uh, get to project completion in a, in a more timely and on cost, on budget, and in uh, on schedule. Um, so that's kind of why we've kind of put that that life cycle, life cycle guidance out uh, and, and are encouraging uh, applicants to take advantage of that. You know, some things for consideration is, you know, again, make sure that it's, it's relevant, the stage you're coming in for is relevant for your project. Um, you have all the documentation to kind of support and demonstrate that yes, this is the project life cycle stage that I'm in, and this is why this track that I'm coming in for is, is the appropriate one, because uh, that again helps us evaluate the project and and, and the application for that subsequent track and, and that funding uh, under the Fed State Partnership Program. So I'm I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny and, and Jenny's going to take us through some of the Fed State partnership eligibility uh, that we we have. So Jenny, to you. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, this is um, Jenny and I'm going to walk us through a couple slides about um, eligibility under the Fed State partnership program. So first, as we talk about eligibility, please remember that your application needs to demonstrate that you satisfy both applicant and project eligibility criteria. Um, here we are, uh, we have below a list of eligible applicants. So states, group of states, interstate compacts. I'll note that public agencies or publicly chartered authorities generally includes transit agencies, um, such as commuter railroad providers or other special purpose transportation agencies. And political subdivisions of states generally means county or municipal governments. Um, Amtrak is eligible as are Indian tribes, which is new under the um, bipartisan infrastructure law and applications may be jointly submitted by any combination and, and number of eligible applicants. As you can see in the purple graphic, um, if you're an entity that's not directly eligible yourself, for example, as a, a private company, nonprofit, freight railroad, etc., cetera, um, you may be included and named in an application as a project partner. Um, and these entities can provide non-federal match funding, letters of support, or, or other uh, roles in support. So, you know, as an applicant, you're encouraged to include them as appropriate in your submissions, um, though these organizations do not count towards the selection preference criteria. Um, if you do intend to partner with an ineligible entity, um, just make sure that that intention is made clear in the application and that you have a letter of support outlining roles and responsibilities for the project um, in your application. Okay, moving to the next slide. So how do you prove your eligibility? Um, we generally have a few uh, suggestions here. So uh, please provide a justification in your narrative with appropriate documentation and that appropriate documentation can include enabling legislation uh, and organizational structure if you're a political subdivision or unit of local government, explain how, um, you know, as an applicant, you exercise independent governmental authority, um, legal explanations, um, and any other relevant information like tax status, et cetera, can all be, can all be relevant here. Under the joint application process, um, please identify the lead applicant and include signed statements from authorized representatives of each joint applicant. And for applicants um, or applications uh, jointly involving Amtrak and other uh, states, please provide cooperative agreements for the project signed by authorized representatives. Okay, so moving on to project eligibility, you see here we have uh, a, few, uh, a few bullet points here on what are eligible projects. They are projects that replace, rehabilitate, or repair infrastructure 
equipment or a facility, uh, projects that improve inner city passenger rail service performance, or expand or establish new inner city passenger rail service. Um, groups of related projects as described above are also eligible um, as are planning, environmental studies, and final design for a project or group of projects um, as relevant above. Again, as Ryan described in previous stages, please remember your life cycle stage and, and what's appropriate for your application. And we also have um, some handy definitions here of what a capital project in, uh, sort of entails, as well as major capital projects, which are uh, we define as a project with a capital cost estimate of 500 million or greater, and with at least 100 million in federal assistance received or requested under the Fed State Partnership Program. Okay. Now, just to mention again about project eligibility, um, to kind of more clearly define inner city passenger rail versus commuter rail, uh, a reminder to everyone that FRA is prohibited under 49 USC 22905F from providing Fed State Partnership grants for commuter rail. So our intent with the Fed State Partnership Program is to fund reasonable investments in capital projects for inner city passenger rail transportation. Um, these projects can be located on shared corridors where commuters and our freight also benefit. But of course, you know, for this program, the Fed State Partnership Program, focus your applications on the inner city passenger rail benefits. And commuter rail, as a reminder, are uh, in involves short haul rail passenger transportation in, in metropolitan suburban areas, usually including reduced fare, multiple rides, commuter tickets, and peak period operations. Okay, and for this last slide on eligibility, I just want to highlight a few reminders. Um, please consider as you're putting together your application, how do you meet the applicant and project eligibility criteria? Um, so we're expecting applicants to provide supporting justification and documentation that addresses these requirements. Um, FRA will, will make final determinations on eligibility upon review of your entire package. Um, but that means we'd like you to consider, you know, how do you make a justification in the narrative, including, you know, do you have all components of the project eligible for funding? Um, how to include all aspects of the project in your justification, include any supporting documentation, citations, hyperlinks, and whether or not you're partnering with um, and other eligible applicants. So we will not be considering ineligible projects and applicants for funding. And th those applications that are deemed ineligible will not be reviewed. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Miriam, to talk about agreements. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so my name is Miriam Ohamu from FRA's Grant and Loan Program Development Division, and I'll be walking you through the agreements requirement of the program um, and also discussing uh, best practices for this topic area. So certain agreements may be required as a condition of receiving um, an FRA grant. Today, I will cover the types of required agreements, walk you through the original source of these requirements, which is 49 U.S. Code Section 22905, um, and then point you to resources for future reference. Um, entities selected to receive funding must uh, satisfy by applicable requirements, such as required agreements as a precondition to um, the FRA issuing a grant award to them. Not all requirements will apply to all projects. Uh, however, here are some examples of agreements that may be required. Um, first is uh, host railroad agreements. These are legal agreements with all applicable host railroads, um, including details on engineering, uh, the statement of work, construction, service outcomes, cost sharing, or any other relevant issues. 
Um, another example is a service operator agreement, um, which are commitments and concurrences from the operator of the intercity passenger rail service that will benefit from the project. And then um, some other examples of agreements that may apply uh, include um, real estate owners, uh, utilities, other states, local governments, et cetera. Please, um, I just wanted to point out, um, please do note that these requirements are prerequisites to obligation, not necessarily selection. However, it would be beneficial for applicants to explain the extent of their existing agreements in their applications and or begin the process um, as early as possible uh, to demonstrate strong project readiness and also uh, avoid future project delays. So um, as I mentioned, 49 U.S. Code Section 22905, um, Section C1, uh, requires uh, as a condition of making a grant uh, for a project that uses uh, rights of way owned by a railroad um, that a written agreement exists between the applicant and um, the railroad uh, right of way owner. So the agreement should include, or must include rather, uh, compensation for such use, um, assurances regarding the adequacy of the infrastructure capacity to accommodate both existing and future uh, freight and passenger operations um, resulting from the project, um, an assurance by the railroad that collective bargaining agreements with the railroad's employees, um, including terms regulating the contracting of work, um, will remain in full force and effect according uh, to the terms of work performed by the railroad on the railroad transportation corridor. Um, and also an assurance that an applicant complies with the liability requirements consistent with 49 U.S. Code uh, Section 28103. Um, and again, at the bottom, this is a, a prerequisite to grant obligation. Um, and just to, to um, clarify uh, the process, there's application, then selection, then um, sort of the lead up uh, an eventual grant obligation, uh, which basically ratifies the grant agreement and the terms um, between FRA and the selected um, entity or the grantee. Um, so the requirements of 49 U.S. Code uh, 22905 do not apply um, if your project does not use railroad rights of way. So, um, for example, if um, the project is for uh, EE and or NEPA, uh, the, um, the right of way uh, um, a railroad agreement may not be uh, applicable there. Um, and also, if the project is for onboard uh, positive train control or PTC installation only, um, then this requirement does not apply. Uh, similarly, um, the requirements do not apply uh, to commuter rail uh, passenger transportation operations um, uh, of a state or local government authority. Uh, or to a rail passenger operations, um, nor uh, will it apply to the Alaska Railroad or its contractors. Uh, and then finally, um, Amtrak's access rights to railroad rights of way and facilities uh, under current law. Um, there is a resource on FRA's website um, with detailed FAQs on uh, 49 uh, U.S. Code 22905 um, and this, uh, um, these requirements, um, which we'll include here. Um, and then just as a reminder, by accepting the grant, uh, the grantee um, 
affirms it has an agreement that meets the requirements or that the requirements do not apply because of the uh, project type. Um, and then some resources here, um, as I mentioned, um, the uh, uh, FAQs um, link is this first one. And then um, there's also a um, grant readiness checklist um, for applying to grants, uh, just to make sure um, you're all set. Um, these are uh, provided in the web links. Um, pod in this Adobe Connect session, um, and I believe they'll also be shared uh, after the webinar um, when the uh, when the presentation is made available. Um, and that concludes my section. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail Grant Program Information Session Eligibility Agreements. A recording of today's information session will be available on FRA's website in the next week. The information session will, at, will end in 20 seconds. Please copy or screenshot the content or information on the screen. Please note, we will email all web links to you after the event. This information session has ended. Thank you so much for joining us today.